Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Not long ago, we were in California, checking out the antique furniture of the wine country, and we really fell in love with one piece, a bedside cupboard. In a moment, I'll show you the antique original, then we'll come back to the workshop and build one, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. How's that for a view? Today we're on Pritchard Hill, one of the highest elevations above the Napa Valley, overlooking Lake Hennessy. We're at the estate of Don and Molly Chapelet. Now they have about 150 acres of vineyard here where they produce a variety of fine wines. Now here's one that I haven't seen before, an old vine cuvee. The grapes to make this wine come from the highest elevation on the hillside and they're the oldest vines. Molly is also a collector of country pine antiques. Now Molly tells me that she uses this piece as a bedside table and the proportions seem to be just right. There's enough room on the top for a bedside lamp or a clock. The door is made out of full thickness stock but the rest of the piece has been made from thin down material. Now I think the trick to making this piece is finding the right timbers and then not making the piece look too refined. Boy, was I lucky. When I went up to my antique wood supplier yesterday, he told me that wood was going in and out of there as fast as he could handle it. But I must have been there on the right day because look at what I found. This pine board is 20 inches wide and about 8 feet long. It has a bead detail on each edge and a groove. Maybe it was part of some wall system. But what's more interesting is the wood itself. If you look at the growth rings, you can see how close they are to one another, which probably means that this came from a tree that was in a very dense forest and grew very slowly. Today, where trees are really farmed, they grow quickly and the growth rings are very far apart, making wood that's not quite as stable for building furniture. So if you happen to see an old house being torn down in your neighborhood, you might go over there and grab some of the boards. It's some of the best lumber you can find. Now look at this piece. Not much at first glance. Some wallpaper, paint, some indication of cleats that might have been nailed on this side. But look at the thickness, an inch thick. And if you look at this side, you see a beautiful piece of pine. It was once painted. It's been hand stripped. And I wouldn't touch this look at all. This is just a beautiful patina. A little too good for the project we're going to build today, so we'll save that for something else. Now, look at what else I found. Often the exterior sheathing or the attic boards of a house are the best lumber you can find. It's a little lower grade, meaning there's more knots, but it's nice and thick. And when you plane it down, if you just remove a little bit of the dirt that's on it, you have beautiful old wood. And I'm particularly interested in pieces like this that show signs of worm activity. And you know, when there's a piece that's just fallen out like this, I don't worry about that. We'll just leave that alone. It will add character to the piece of furniture that we'll eventually build. And I want to show you something else that I found while I was up there. This, at first glance, may look like oak, but it's actually chestnut, a tree that doesn't grow in New England anymore. Now, Dave Moon was actually taking old chestnut beams and re-sawing them and eventually turning these boards into flooring. I said, this is much too good for flooring. It has beautiful character, and I'm going to make a furniture project out of it. I don't know exactly what it's going to be yet, but we'll find something to build out of it. Now, over on the workbench is a pine board that I've se selected for today's project. This will be the sides for our nightstand. This, again, was a piece of pine that's been stripped. And I'm not going to touch this side at all. I want to preserve this look. Now, the most difficult thing in working with antique lumber is removing the hardware. Often you'll find nails or screws or other bits of metal in the wood. And I want to remove those. When I was up at the antique lumber supplier, they were using one of those scanners that you walk down the beach with, a metal detector. And I thought that was a pretty good idea. So we went out and bought a handheld metal detector. Often you'll see these at airport security. Now I'm going to span the board between my workbench and this back bench because any metal that's underneath in the bench, this will detect. It's very sensitive. All I have to do is turn it on and start to scan the board. 
Let's see. All right, we have a bit of metal right there. I'm going to have to dig it out with my awl. Check the other side. Ah, there it is. We got a nail right there. And we'll just pull that out. It'll take a while to go over the whole board, but we'll get every bit we can find. Well, we didn't get much tonnage out of these two boards, but it only takes one little piece of metal like this to put a nick in a perfectly good set of planer blades. Now, the next thing I want to do is rough cut some pieces of stock. But before we use any power tools, let's take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now the first thing I want to do with these boards is just trim off the bottom edge where these nails are. That's not going to be any good. And then I'm going to cut two side pieces about 30 inches long out of this board. And now I'm just going to rip off the tongue and the groove. I don't need those parts. Now the next thing I want to do is run my boards through the surface planer so that they end up to be 5 eighths of an inch thick. I want to preserve this face so I'll remove all the material from the back side and get rid of all this old wallpaper and hope that that metal detector picked up all the nails. Now here's the procedure to make the edges of the board straight, square, and parallel to one another. First, I'll run one edge through the joint. Next, I set the freshly jointed edge up against the rip fence, which is set for a distance that's a 32nd of an inch wider than the final piece I want. That'll make the edges parallel. Now the final step is to take the freshly sawn edge and join it. The next thing I want to do is trim my boards to the correct length. The first step is to trim one end of the board so that it's square. You mark it for length, which in this case is 27 and a half inches. And if I slide the board over so that the mark is right at the end of the jig, it'll end up the right length and perfectly square. Now I've clamped one of the side panels here at my workbench to make a series of cuts. I want to make a rabbit at the top edge for the top of the box, a stop dado for the interior shelf, and a through dado for the bottom shelf. To mill them, I'm going to use my router, which I've set up with a half inch straight cutting bit, and this straight edge clamp to guide the base of the router. Okay, now I've just changed my router bit. I've put in a rabbiting bit, which will give me a 3 8 inch by 3 8 inch rabbit which I want to run down the back edge of each side panel to conceal the back. Now a sharp chisel is all I need to finish up the stop dado. Now I've just completed cutting a piece of quarter inch plywood which is going to be for the back of the nightstand. Now the rule when working with this antique lumber is that anything that doesn't show, I'm going to use new material because the antique lumber is rare and it's expensive. So I also took some time to take some new pine, mill it to a half inch thick, and that'll be the bottom shelf and one for the intermediate shelf and one for the top. 
Now we're ready for some assembly. A little bit of glue along the back edges of the nightstand and then I can install this quarter inch plywood back and attach it with some three quarter inch brads. Now this is a little piece that will actually be an extension out from this lower shelf so that I can nail on the base of the cabinet and it fills in a gap under the door. It needs to be notched around the sides of the panel. So I'm just going to set it down at the bottom, take my combination square, and put a mark on each side. Now to make the notch, I'm just going to nibble away the material using my table saw and the miter gauge as a guide. And a couple brads will hold the piece in place. Now this piece of pine that I just planed down to five-eighths of an inch thick, I'll use to make the base. Now I want to chamfer the top edge of all the pieces for the base. And to do that, I've set up my router table with a chamfering bit, adjusted the rip fence and the height of the bit. Now I want to miter the corners of the base when it goes around the bottom of the nightstand. So I have a mark here for length and then a little slash mark that shows me the angle of the miter. Now to the miter box. Now with all the pieces mitered, I'm ready to nail them in place. Now I don't want to use any glue on the pieces that run along the side because I have a cross grain situation. Just nails. Now I can put a little bit of glue on the miter joint to keep that secure. Okay, well I think that's just about going to do it for today. Tomorrow we'll make the top and a nice panel door. Well I got started today by rough cutting some pieces for the top of our nightstand. Now the antique original had a very thin top that had just slightly beveled edges. It was very plain. And I think we can dress it up a little bit because after all the top is the most visible part of the piece. Now here's a piece of pine for the field of the top. And the back is charred a bit so wherever this was it must have been close to a fire at one time. Now it is a little bit wider than will fit through my planer and if you look at it closely it's also cupped. So it isn't the worst thing in the world to split this board in half which will allow me to run it through my surface planer rejoint the edges and glue it back together which will flatten it out. Now from the same board that I cut the field I also cut some narrower strips which will make a breadboard edge to dress it up. The first thing I want to do is split this board in half. pretty good. I think when we glue that together, you're not even going to know there's a joint there. 
but I think we'll cut a couple biscuit slots to reinforce the joint. Well, while the panel for the top dries, let's start working on the door. Using the same techniques that you saw me use earlier, I surface planed, ripped and jointed all the pieces for the door. There are two styles, two rails, and a panel which I planed to a quarter of an inch thick. The first thing I want to do is make a groove in the styles and rails to receive the panel. So I've set up my stacked dado head cutter with a quarter of an inch of width a depth of three-eighths of an inch, and adjusted the rip fence so that the groove will be right down the center of each piece. The rails and styles of the door are going to be joined with a mortise and tenon joint. I want to cut the mortises in the styles, so I've laid out the location and set up my designated mortiser with a quarter-inch chisel with a drill bit that passes down through the center. The drill bit will remove most of the material and the chisel will square it up. Now the other side of that joint is a tenon which I mill in the rails. So I've set up my table saw with a stop block attached to the rip fence and that will set the distance to make the shoulder cut on each side of the rail. I'll guide the piece through using my miter gauge. Now here I've installed my tenoning jig at the table saw. It rides in the same slot as the miter gauge. And what it does for me is it allows me to hold pieces in a vertical position safely so I can run them through the saw to make the cheek cut. To complete the tenon, I have to remove a little bit of material along the top edge. I want to make the tenon narrow enough to fit into the mortise that I've already made. But I don't want to go all the way back to the shoulder. I want to leave this bit of material, which is known as a haunch, so that it fills the groove I've allowed for the panel. Well, let's assemble the door. A little bit of glue in the mortise along the edge of the style where the rail's going to meet it, and some glue on the tenon. Now I can slip in the panel. No glue here. I just want it to float. All right, we'll let that set up and we'll get back to work on that top. With the blank for the top removed from the clamps and cut to size, you can see that I still have a little bit of a problem. This half is sitting nice and flat, even all the way up to this point. But the rest of it still has a little bit of a cup to it. Now to solve that problem, I'm going to make a kerf cut from the back side a little over halfway through the thickness. Now that should relieve some of the stress and allow it to lay flat when I attach it to the base. Ah, that should do it. Now here I've made a test piece of what I want the end grain of the top to look like. I need a tenon to receive the breadboard edge. So I've set up my stacked dado head cutter and this sacrificial strip of wood so that the blade won't hit the metal rip fence. And I want to run the piece through, but as I do, the important thing to do is hold it flat to the table and tight up against the fence. Okay, that's going to be good. Now to make the groove in the breadboard edge, I've put my saw blade back in the table saw and adjusted the rip fence so that by making one pass from each face of the breadboard edge, I have a groove that's perfectly centered and exactly the right width. Now here's my setup for attaching the breadboard edges. First, I'm going to clamp the edges to the field of the top to make sure that the joint is as tight as possible. 
And I'm going to secure each edge with some dowels. So first I'm going to drill a hole. If you notice, I installed a scrap piece of wood underneath so that when the drill bit goes through, I won't get any tear out. Then I'm going to drive a piece of dowel through the hole. The dowel is what holds everything in place. I want no glue. And then I'll use my saw to trim it off. Just a, bit, a little bit higher than the surface, and then we'll drive it flush. With the breadboard edges installed, I want to make a decorative cut along the front edge and the two sides using an OG bit in my router. To secure the top to the base, I'm just going to place it right in the center and drive four screws from the inside of the cabinet. Well, now we're ready to hang the door. And I want to mortise the hinges into the cabinet and the door because the mortise will help support the weight of the door rather than depending just on the screws. So the first thing I do is set the hinge in position and put a score mark across right at the top and bottom of the hinge. Now to remove the material to make the mortise, I'm actually going to use my router, which I've set up with a straight cutting bit. I'll remove the majority of the material and clean the rest up with a sharp chisel. Now I like to use this spring-loaded punch to give me a centering hole to start the screws. Okay, well that takes care of the woodworking and the installation of the hardware. Now I want to think about finishing this piece, and I think I'll start by painting the inside a nice, flat, dark green. I'm using an acrylic latex paint for the interior of the nightstand for its durability and ease of application. I've also found that I like these three-inch foam brushes for applying the paint. While we were in England a couple years ago, going through various antique shops and talking to antique dealers, we found out that one of their trade secrets in treating old pieces of furniture was to use a lot of wax, either just natural beeswax or beeswax like this that has a dark pigment in it. And what they're able to do is actually take freshly milled edges on the antique lumber and by covering it with this wax, it blends in more with the untouched portions. Now what we're actually going to do is put on at least a couple coats of wax to build up a finish and then we'll buff it in. Well here it is, after about five coats of wax and a slight buffing, the beauty of the wood is really showing through. Everyone who sees this project would like to order about five, which tells me that this can be a very useful piece of furniture. I think the success of this project was really in the selection of the right timbers.